saw a spreadsheet, because nobody knew what a spreadsheet was. I came up with the name Visible Calculator, or VisiCalc, because you wanted to emphasize that aspect. VisiCalc hit the market in October 1979, selling for $100. Marv Goldschmidt sold the first copies from his computer store in Bedford, Massachusetts. After a slow start, VisiCalc took off. What it did in our society, it gave people who were obsessed with numbers, whether they're in business or at home, how much am I worth today? What's my stock portfolio worth? How am I doing against budget on this project? It gave them the ability to play with scenarios and change it and say, well, what if I do this? So put people, in a sense, in control of the thing that lots of people in our society feel is driving them, and that's numbers. The spreadsheet was every businessman's crystal ball. It answered all those time. The computer says so. Five bucks up, 25! Five The effect of the spreadsheet was enormous. Armed with an Apple II running visit count, a 24-year-old MBA with two pieces of dubious data could convince his corporate managers to allow him to loot the corporate pension fund and do a leverage file. Right. It was the perfect tool for the 80s, the me decade, when money was everything and greed was good. The money seemed limitless. Cash flow. The whiz kids, many fresh out of college, drawn here by the lure of big money. Estimates. He'd made millions for himself and others selling junk bonds. Forecasts or plans. A group that has been motivated by greed. Account can help you work faster. In five years, the PC had gone from a hobbyist toy to an engine that shaped the times we lived in. Thanks to VisiCalc, the Apple II made history. Everybody you talked to just seemed excited about talking about what we were doing. And uh, there was this huge media explosion, kind of like the Internet is receiving today, of this is the happening thing. You read about it over and over and over, and every time you took an airplane flight, you read about it. And every newspaper every week, you'd read something about small computers coming. And Apple was one of the highlight companies. So we were being portrayed as a leader of a revolution. And we really felt that we were a leader of a revolution. We were going to change life a lot. Pretty good for a company started in a garage three years before. But not all the PC pioneers made great fortunes. Dan Bricklin decided not to patent his spreadsheet idea. Though more than 100 million spreadsheets have been sold since 1979, Bricklin and Frankston haven't earned VisiCalc royalties in years. You know, looking back at how successful a lot of other people have been, it's kind of sad that we weren't as successful. It would be very nice to be gazillionaires, um, but it can also understand that the, part of the reason was that that's not what we were trying to be. We're kids of the 60s, and what did you want to do? You wanted to make the world better, and you wanted to make your mark on the world and improve things, and we did it. So by the mark of what we would measure ourselves by, we're very successful. Yes. And what about Ed Roberts? Three years and 40,000 computers after assembling that first Altair, the fun was over for Ed. MITS was just another player in what had become a competitive market for personal computers. Roberts sold his company in 1978 and started a new life. When people started taking credit for things that we did at MITS, uh, and that, that's the only thing I think about it, it irritates me, the things that we did at MITS that we took all the heat for, that other people have tried to take credit for, and uh, that frustrates me. While Ed Roberts invented the personal computer, it was the founders of Apple who got rich. When Apple went public in spectacular fashion in 1980, Jobs and Woz became multi-millionaires. The nerds had inherited the earth. I was worth um, about over a million dollars when I was 23, and over 10 million dollars when I was 24, and over 100 million dollars when I was 25. Um, and it's, it wasn't that important, uh, because I never did it for the money. It was just a little hobby company like a lot of people do, not thinking anything of it. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like we both thought it was going to go a long ways. It was like, we'll both do it for fun. But back then, there was a short window in time where one person who could sit down and do some neat, good designs could turn them into a huge thing like the Apple II.
It's astonishing that at the beginning of 1975, nobody owned a personal computer. All there was was a mock-up on a magazine cover. Yet within five years, there had emerged here in Silicon Valley a billion-dollar industry. An unhealthy fascination with technology on the part of a few adolescents had awakened the nerd within us all. PC companies were sprouting like mushrooms to meet the enormous demand. Apple had emerged as the top fungus and had taken 50% of the market. To the boys in Cupertino, every day seemed like Christmas. But Scrooge was around the corner. There was a company that everyone associated with the word computer, a company that expected, no, demanded to dominate its market, IBM. Big Blue was on the move, and Silicon Valley would soon be feeling the reverberation.